Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So, yes, indeed, the clue is in the title. So, firstly, starting off with the second generation integrase inhibitors and women's health. Now, we've heard already from Dan this morning some of the issues around pregnancy, and hopefully I'll add a little bit more. But essentially, we know the second generation integrases have the same pros and cons for women as they do for anybody living with HIV. But there are those additional considerations. Some of them are beneficial, so there's no interaction with hormonal contraception, for example, for bictegravir or dolutegravir. But of course, when we think about dolutegravir, and I must caveat the complete absence of knowledge about bictegravir, as Sharon emphasised, but for dolutegravir in pregnancy, actually it's been shown to be superior to efavirenz in late pregnancy, shown in the Dolphin 1 study, and we have a lead of that study sat here. Dolphin one and two. Um, and actually the higher infant exposures to dolutegravir in utero and during the first week of life in this study may actually offer additional prophylaxis against HIV transmission. So it has clear potential benefits against efavirenz, which is the main alternative at a global level. But of course there's this neural tube defect signal. And if we go through that, of course, we have the Tsepamo cohort from Botswana and that initial figure from early last year of a 0.94 per 1,000 prevalence, which is about tenfold higher than that seen in women exposed to efavirenz periconception or HIV-negative women. That signal was attenuated, so reduced by about two-thirds in the updated of the data in Mexico. However, although it's hard to see, the prevalence of neural tube defects remains significantly higher for women on dolutegravir periconception. It was very small, but it was still statistically significant. At the same conference, we've already talked through some of this data. I think the main thing to say here is that we must all try and report to the antiretroviral pregnancy registry. It has clear lim limitations compared to the Botswana cohort in terms of retrospective versus prospective and no standardization necessarily of reporting, but it's still important to collect the data because almost all of the data for that registry comes from North America, where it's worth noting they've been supplementing food with folic acid since 1998. I think what came out at the Mexico conference, which should have come out much, much sooner, in my opinion, were the disadvantages of the alternatives and some modelling studies actually couching the potential risk of dolutegravir against the risks of alternatives really should have been addressed earlier. So, for example, the signal for protease inhibitors and preterm delivery, models showing more virologic failure and more transmissions on efavirenz versus dolutegravir, and seeing the figures, for example, as for every neural tube defect avoided, there could be three transmissions to partners, two transmissions to infants and one infant death. Those are the sorts of figures that were discussed. There was a lot of stuff on possible mechanisms and of course everyone's been challenging folic acid receptors and all sorts of things. The, the one thing that did come out and, and the key thing is any demonstration of harm is usually at very, 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 very high drug concentrations, far higher than you'd ever see in clinical practice. But for me, zebrafish, and zebrafish are the latest model, and actually apparently provide quite an accurate model for mammalian uh, sort of neurodevelopmental defects. Zebrafish exposed to dolutegravir develop toxicities that are reversed by folate. So there are some possible mechanisms there. Again, I think the clear message that's come out over the last year and a half is the community engagement, or certainly the lack of it at the initial stages, and really the importance of informed choice. And I think that initial knee-jerk reaction of many country guidelines to deny women access to dolutegravir was quite rightly and forcibly challenged by the community. Of course, the World Health Organization, as I'm sure you know, for the updated treatment guidelines, placed dolutegravir as the first choice for all people, including women of childbearing age. I think the other thing that came out is the importance of access to effective contraception. We saw from the ECHO trial, and the ECHO trial was set up to look at the impact of different long-acting methods of contraception on HIV acquisition risk in HIV-negative women. But it also showed us, for example, that the progestogen implant is superior to the copper coil, and making sure that women have access to the most effective contraception, whether they're HIV-negative or positive, is crucial. So what next? I think the challenge is that if the neural tube defect signal is not real, the authors have concluded the Botswana cohort will likely never fully refute it. So we're never actually going to prove that to be not real if it's not real, if that makes sense. 
But it may well be the best that we have. Other planned cohorts probably aren't ever going to be designed in a way that they'll be able to refute the signal either. And this is probably going to require women and clinicians to live with that uncertainty. And I think it's important that we need to talk about absolute risks. And as I've mentioned, you must talk about the absolute risks of the alternative options as well. Certainly, though, the NTD concern has raised the profile of folic acid. And we do know that folic acid supplementation preconception and for the early pregnancy stages, but also fortification of food does prevent neural tube defects. However, if you actually look at the data for many NTDs, the risk factors are not known. So actually in the US, the caveat being that folic acid food fortification occurs, so clearly the attributable fraction for folic depletion is going to be smaller. But actually for more than half of neural tube defects in the US, the etiology is unknown. This is where it's a bit embarrassing for the UK, actually, because it was in 1991 that the Medical Research Council vitamin study demonstrated that pre- and early conception folic acid reduced neural tube defects. As I mentioned already, the US has fortified flour with folic acid since 1998. And in the UK, they undertook a study of eight congenital anomaly registries, showed a neural tube defect prevalence of 1.28 per thousand. But actually, they estimated had the US levels of folic acid fortification of food been applied in the UK at the same time, more than 2,000 neural tube defects would have been averted. And that's in the UK alone. They concluded in this study published in 2016 that fortification of flour with folic acid should be a priority UK public health policy. And you'd be pleased to hear that the proposal and the consultation to add folic acid to flour ended in September of this year. I mean, and that's crazy. We are a rich country. We have access to systems that many parts of the world can only dream of. And look how behind we are. The most important lesson learned from all this, I think, is never again should sweeping, treatment-limiting decisions be made without community engagement. And I think that's clear to us all. So moving on to second-generation instances and weight. So I'm going to pose a question to you. So someone comes in, a patient says, dear doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or other member of the multidisciplinary team, I've put on weight and I think it's my HIV medication. Who's had that question in the last couple of years? Now, what would you have said in 2017? You'd have said no, wouldn't you? Eat less, do more. You'd have done what I do, which is patronisingly tap my own belly after 10 years of very happy marriage and say, yes, sweetheart, it happens to us all. But what would you say now? Would you say it might be the drugs? Yeah, a few nods. So, in a nutshell, the story started with patient reports. Then we saw the cohort and RCT analyses. And again, as we've heard already, it's the integrases, particularly as a class. It's the second generation integrases more than the first. It's TAF more than the back of it, more than TDF. And the risk factors of being female, being black, and being older, all associated with a higher risk of excessive weight gain. But there is much ongoing uncertainty, of course, about the mechanisms for this, the implications, and the, importantly, the reversibility. This summarises some of the first-line RCTs, looking at weight changes out to 96 weeks. These are all first-line studies. But the things to pull out on the far left, we've got the Gilead 1489 study, which shows a relative protective effect of a Bacavir 3TC compared to TAF FTC. 1490, which is essentially BIC versus Dolutegravir, both with a F-TAF backbone, you're seeing much more similar weight gain. In Gemini, you've got Dolutegravir Lamivudine versus Dolutegravir Truvada, and you're seeing this fairly consistent protective effect of TDF. And finally, as we've discussed already this morning, advance showing that if you're not studying a mainly white, mainly male population, you may see much more marked changes. And again, that highest bar for dolutegravir and FTAF showing an eight kilogram weight gain in a 60% female and also almost exclusively black trial population. What that masks though is the differences between men and women. And for men, that weight gain was five kilos for women it was 10. This is the NEAT22 study that Anton mentioned this morning and this is just to show a quite elegant parallel for the red line of immediate switch from PI to dolutegravir for the blue line delayed switch from PI to dolutegravir. You can see from that almost kind of rhomboid shape that there is this clear association albeit a small less than one kilo weight gain but an association with switch from a PI in suppressed people to dolutegravir. 
So I want to really focus the discussion on some possible reasons why. So one of the things discussed, of course, is return to health. And certainly when Francois Venter, who presented the advanced study at Mexico this year, he concluded this cannot be a return to health as the weight trajectory did not change after viral suppression was achieved. But of course, that makes the assumption that return to health is all about viral suppression. Now, undoubtedly, people who are very sick and very catabolic and burning calories, fighting lots of infections, will gain weight when they start treatment. But that doesn't mean that healthy people, starting with CD4 counts of 700, won't also have a return to health phenomenon as well. So let's imagine that it's not about viral suppression for many people. It's actually about the normalization of immune activation. And let's take the best studied surrogate marker of immune activation that's routinely accessible, which is a CD4, CD8 ratio. And we know the CD4, CD8 ratio, even after viral suppression, and relative CD4 normalization have been achieved, that ratio continues to improve up to 15 years into suppressive treatment. So what if that's what's driving return to health? It's also been discussed, is this a new lipohypertrophy? I think from what we understand and where kind of DEXA scans have been undertaken, it's probably not that. It's probably a more generalized weight gain. Again, the fact that we're all living in an obesogenic environment, is it simply down to that has been mooted? We had some discussion this morning about is this all related to better tolerability, particularly related to fewer GI side effects. Could it actually be secondary to impact of drugs on mood or sleep? There are clear associations between insomnia and depression with changes in weight. Could it all be related to actually kind of central mood effects? When it comes to TDF, could it be protective due to its lipid lowering impact? I know Marta Befito from Chelsea Westminster has talked about the fact that TDF could be binding fat in the gut, therefore reducing fat absorption. Or could it be something else? And I've been scraping PubMed for you to find some possible something else's. Now, one has been presented many times is the melanocortin thing. So essentially, dolutegravir at clinically relevant concentrations inhibits melanocyte-stimulating hormone binding to melanocortin-4 receptor. Now, the details aren't really important, but basically dolutegravir affects a receptor that's known to be important in regulating food intake and energy use. Mice that have that receptor knocked out are fat mice, and people with genetic obesity, which is very rare, can have abnormalities with that receptor. So we've got a biologically plausible mechanism here. What I think is more compelling is the gut microbiome, because we know from general medicine there are clear associations between your gut microbiome and obesity. Fecal microbial transplantation, or FMT, which of course is now an established treatment for Clostridium difficile. If you do FMT from lean donors into people with metabolic syndrome, their insulin sensitivity improves. And there are ongoing recruiting studies looking at FMT from lean to fat donors to see if they lose weight. What about antiretroviral therapy and HIV in the gut? Well, we know that the gut microbiome is not surprisingly dramatically altered by HIV, and this correlates with both the stage and duration of HIV infection. <laughs> The gut microbiome improves, but doesn't entirely normalize on treatment, much as we see with many other inflammatory and immune activation markers. But interestingly, protease inhibitors may particularly reduce good microbes, whereas integrases may least harm good microbes. And if those good microbes are helping with nutrient absorption, could this be a potential additional explanation? And certainly, that's the mechanism for risperidone. So we think about the Drug, drug type most associated with weight gain, which is antipsychotics, risperidone, I won't go into the details, but clearly has an impact on microbiome, which is reproducible in animal studies using, again, fecal microbial transplants from risperidone-treated mice to risperidone-untreated mice. So again, there's a whole wealth of work here already that we can try and tap into. And I'm not going to read this list, you'll be pleased to hear, but these are just some of the mechanisms postulated for antipsychotic weight gain. So you can look forward to a cornucopia of posters at every conference you go to looking at the impact of drugs on one of these isolated markers, which is probably not the way to go because these are about cascades. This is complex and really a coordinated effort to study all of this as a whole rather than lots of piecemeal posters would be the way forward, but I doubt we'll be able to do that. 
What they conclude here for the antipsychotic induced weight gain is genetic polymorphisms may explain the individual variation. And when we think back to advance and the clear differences based on ethnicity and gender, there may well be a genetic kind of uh, ex explanation for the differences seen with antiretroviral weight gain as well. The key question, of course, is does this rapid drug-induced weight gain have the same consequences as endogenous weight gain? And actually, the work looking at the so-called metabolically healthy overweight and obese population shows the relative importance of weight as a contributor to morbidity and mortality depends on the presence or absence of metabolic syndrome also. So we must think about this not in isolation, but is the weight gain associated with other metabolic changes that could be harmful? One thing just to mention, though, is there is work showing that for some drugs, exposure is significantly reduced in obese people. And this was tenofovir, efavirenz, and lopinavir, all shown to be lower and more likely to be below established efficacy thresholds. Do we know this about some other drugs? I'm thinking particularly real pivirine with its low genetic barrier at the doses used in clinical practice. Could this be driving some of the failures that we're seeing with real pivirine injectables? However, for now, we're nearly there. We must measure weight. We must also consider whether we have adequate control data in our populations. It's the duty of all of us to counsel about risks, diet, exercise, other lifestyle modifications, and smoking being the obvious. But I think we have to accept that weight gain will likely be multifactorial. But a key thing that we can learn from psychiatry is someone counseled to expect weight gain will gain less weight than someone who isn't. And that advice must be specific and repeated. It's not good enough to say, eat less and do more. We need to give clear instructions about getting out of breath 20 minutes at least three times a week as a minimum for meeting exercise standards. I think the clear thing is there's no evidence yet for a benefit of switch. I think anecdotes are starting to abound in terms of switching people away from integrases. We've had one person lost six kilos, but that was switching to efavirenz. Don't shout me down. Um, so finally, in terms of next steps, what can we learn from psychiatry? And this is from a paper where they looked, these are randomized placebo-controlled trials. So what this is showing us is across antipsychotic trials with weight as an endpoint, this was looking at the impact of cognitive behavioral therapy or intensive nutritional counseling. Key message is 2.6 kilo less weight gain if you had this intervention compared to none. But just to emphasize, this isn't just saying eat less, do more. In one study, that was eight flexible intervention modules, blah, 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 it was quite detailed stuff. Even more effective, though, is metformin, which has been studied as a treatment for antipsychotic weight gain. And again, these are placebo-controlled, randomized trials, 3.3 kilo less weight gain for people given metformin compared to people given placebo. And of course, we know that metformin may have benefits for people with HIV. This is just one study looking at people with metabolic syndrome, showing that metformin compared to lifestyle modification was associated with prevention of coronary plaque progression. So it has potential cardiovascular benefits. And finally, Metformin, due to its modulatory effects on T cell activation and inflammation, is being studied in terms of its impact on the HIV reservoir. This is the LILAC study. Prizes for anyone know, who knows why it's called the LILAC study. Jonathan, you can't answer because you've seen this before. So it's the sort of thing I'd expect you to know in a sort of Liverpool pub quiz. The answer is metformin was isolated from French lilac in the 1930s. So there you go. So I'm going to finish there. I've also overrun slightly. I do apologise. But we're going to likely have to live with some dolutegravir and neural tube defect uncertainty. For weight, there are emerging differences. We might not know why, but we can still give advice. But much work is required, I think, particularly on the impact on obesity-related diseases, but also effective interventions. We must talk to and listen to our patients. I think the dolutegravir story has told us we should have engaged patients sooner. And the weight story, certainly for me, means I should have listened to my patients earlier. But to tie this all together, in the US now, obesity drives more neural tube defects and folic acid deficiency. Thank you very much for your attention.